testing should be easy peasy, but it's not. Do we need to bring back some some form of Operation Warp Speed to create state of the art, easy at home testing? That's what's going to keep us safe. Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me back. It is what's going to keep us safe. Uh, look, look, the administration's done a lot of things well. I don't think their strategy on testing, until very recently, uh, has been as aggressive and as focused as it needs to be. Uh, we should have been building up testing supplies through the spring and summer. Uh, certainly by the fall with Delta, it was very clear we would need testing for a while. Um, we should have billions of these tests widely available uh, for a country our size. We don't, and that really hurts us, I think, I think, at this point in the holiday season. But I'm really pleased to see us moving forward in the right direction. Like, look, we got to always look forward, and I think we should have a lot more tests in January. got to keep going on this. This virus isn't going away. The ability to test ourselves quickly and efficiently is going to be something we're going to need for, for months and maybe years. Gabe, take us to Queens. Why are these people waiting in long lines for hours and hours? Are they sick or is it they're traveling? They need it for work. They need to get a negative test in order to move forward with their lives. Uh, hi there, Stephanie. Well, you know, several uh, people here in line tell us any variety of those reasons for getting this test. I spoke with one woman a short time ago. She thought, uh, you know, she might have been exposed by a roommate. She's just here checking. Others say no, uh, they don't feel any symptoms. However, uh, they do plan uh, to travel over the next couple of days, as you mentioned. Now, Stephanie, New York State reported another record number of COVID cases for the fourth consecutive day. And just, you know, we've been seeing these testing lines now for several days, and I want to take you over here. And it extends much further than you think. It actually surprised me when I got here this morning. It extends all the way around the block. I mean, just look over here as my photojournalist uh, colleague, Bill Angelucci, shows you. This keeps going. Some of these folks have been waiting here now for three hours, Stephanie. And this is the frustration that is mounting. Several days ago, Mayor Bill de Blasio urged the Biden administration to really try and get a handle on this testing situation. And this is, is the result. There's a lot of frustration here from these uh, folks that have been waiting in line here for several hours already in freezing temperatures. Now, another point I want to make, uh, Stephanie, uh, New York's governor has said, uh, you know, because there's a lot of concern about parents uh, and schools and what might happen over the next uh, coming days and weeks if this surge continues to mount with the Omicron variant, as you mentioned, now making up 73 percent of new cases. They made up just 13 percent uh, last week. But the New York governor is insisting, she is vowing that schools will stay open with better access to testing. But right now, ahead of the holidays, there is mounting frustration here by many folks who say that it should be easier to get a test at this point. The Biden administration, Stephanie, trying to uh, calm those fears with its announcement today. Stephanie. Yamish, is the administration seeing this? Because vaccinated people are not getting super sick. But they are trying to do the right thing and get tested. And there you have it. People waiting hours in line in the freezing cold. If it remains this difficult... A lot of people are going to say, forget it. I don't want to know if I have it. And that'll be much more dangerous. That would be much more dangerous, Stephanie. And I think when you when you hear from White House officials is that the president is understanding that testing needs to be ramped up in this country. That's why he is giving this speech where they're going to be saying that they're going to make available half a billion at-home tests. Now, for weeks, they've been facing questions on why they haven't been doing that. We've seen other countries mail free tests to every member of their society. We've seen free tests be available in other countries in Europe. And there was a big question of why the United States wasn't doing that. The Biden administration's um, answer had been consistently, well, we're making it so that insurance companies have to cover these at-home tests. We don't want to waste tests was part of what White House Secretary Jen Psaki was saying in the, in the idea that they didn't want to just mail tests to people's homes that did not request one. So in this new system, people are going to be able to have this website, request a test, and they're going to be able to get it. The question, of course, is how long is that going to take? There are also going to be new testing sites set up. But really, this comes from in, in really a, a response in some ways to criticism. The president has been saying and has been doing, of course, much more than the last administration. He's been 
talking about the virus, telling people to get vaccinated, take, telling people to get boosted. But there has been this sort of criticism of the president of why aren't you doing even more, especially as we know these variants are just going to get worse and worse. And I have to also add that one of the biggest challenges for President Biden is something that he didn't create, and that is that people, the people who need to hear him most, they just don't find him credible. The people that are most likely not to be vaccinated in this country are Republicans, specifically white male Republicans. Last time I checked in the research, that that group of people are not going to look at the speech that President Biden is giving and probably not going to be moved just talking to, to doctors. So there really also needs to be this sort of strategy to get into those people's homes, to get to the people that they trust, most likely their doctors, based on some of the focus groups that I've watched. And that's really going to be a, a real challenge here, sort of how do you cut through the politics and the and the sort of conspiracy theories of scientists to try to explain to Americans that this is really a life and death situation that they need to take seriously. Well, then let's talk to a doctor. Dr. Christudius, you're in Jersey. There are all sorts of vaccine-hesitant people there, but there's also vaccinated people who are getting sick. We want to get your reaction to the Omicron becoming this dominant variant. On one hand, it sounds like good news because cases are not as bad as Delta, but take us to your hospital and tell us what we're missing. Yeah, well, in the tri-state area, what we're seeing is a pretty bad uh, breakthrough uh, effectiveness of Omicron. It seems to be very adept at taking people who are doing the right thing, getting vaccinated, getting boosted, and it seems to be breaking through. Now, it's mixed news that it's not as deadly, but you still have a lot, have to worry a lot about disability and a lot of the heart problems, you know, that, that the, the virus can cause. Um, the big question um, and the big problem with it is it's eight to two to eight times as contagious as Delta. So if you want to talk about in terms of um, uh, uh, contagiousness being uh, like flammability, it's like the regular COVID was just regular kerosene. This is like napalm. It's going to burn itself out. It's going to spread like wildfire, for lack of a better term. And unfortunately, we're being told now um, that our federal stockpile of monoclonals is is gone, is completely depleted. And we had pleaded with, uh, and I don't think you can lay it on the president, but maybe this, uh, the the Dr. Kessler, the COVID response, the chief science officer for COVID response team, negated our request for increasing the stockpile for monoclonals. We're getting emails from massive systems like Sinai and NYU in the city saying, we are shutting down the monoclonal because the testing is the first half of the equation, but what do you do once you test positive? We have patients who are breaking through who are immunocompromised, leukemia patients with, you know, on chemotherapy who did get both, both doses of vaccine and a boost and are breaking through with infection now. And they're turning to me saying, where do I go for monoclonals? And we're telling them, look, we're sorry. Programs are getting shut down all over the tri-state area. That makes this no is, sense. This is pretty bad. So two things. Do monoclonals work on Omicron? The GlaxoSmith does. That's Got the one it. that a. we are very short on. And why on earth are we short on them, right? Why, why don't you have enough? Well, from the explanation we got, um, the feeling was that the vaccine w and would make it uh, uh, moot. But the problem is, is that, um, you know, we knew that other variants could come making the vaccine less effective. And that's what's happened. It's not, oh, we do know that the vaccine is effective, but not as effective. And it's why we're seeing breakthrough cases. And you also have to consider a large segment of the population is still being unvaccinated. But on top of that, the people who are vaccinated, who are particularly frail, immunocompromised, are still going to break through. And when we have a shortage of monoclonals to treat those people, uh, it's, it's, it's a big problem. I mean, just like the previous speakers had said, I, I wish, you know, we need to start acting and not reacting. We need to be prepared. And this is our third wave. And I'm just a weary guy, you know, dealing with patients. I, I, last week, I had multiple patients with COVID I was operating on. I had, you know, and it really slows down the care of uh, altogether. I had to go, I see a patient with COVID, I have to go home and shower, come back to the hospital. It's a complete disaster. And we need to be able to start thinking more forward thinking. I mean, we had our Congress allocated billions of dollars, billions of dollars for testing. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem like any of that money has been spent yet. And again, these are questions way over my pay grade. Um, but um, we need to actually start getting ahead of the ball, getting ahead of the game. We can't, you know, like I said, it's, I feel like a soldier on the third wave of an attack. We're finding out we're out of bullets. I mean, it's a big uh, problem, um, you know, and we just see we just see the patients who are having trouble getting monoclonals and breaking through. Dr. Ja, are, sad. are you seeing and hearing this not enough tests and now not enough monoclonals? That doesn't make sense. But if both those things are true, can we ramp up production? So we can ramp up production. And I think in testing, I, I do think the administration has gotten religion on this in the last couple of months, and they're starting to move forward on this. And I think that's great.
Uh, we can forget, you know, we don't have to go back and relitigate what happened in the months before then. Uh, on monoclonals, most of them, Regeneron, Lilly, they do not work very well against Omicron. Uh, until about a week ago or so, it was still mostly Delta. Now it is Omicron, so that's becoming a real problem. Um, and we've got to ramp up productions of the, of the monoclonals that do and got to build new ones. That's going to take a little time, but yeah, we've got to put all of our efforts, you know, Defense Production Act, everything we need to kind of to throw at getting more of these monoclonals out there for people who are having bad breakthrough infections or people who are immunocompromised for whom the vaccines were never going to work fully.